I believe in trying to reach the heart. I think tenderness, simplicity, and little human touches are essential in making the audience live in and believe what you tell them. Those words are director Frank Borzaghi's comments during a radio adaptation of his film Fairwater Arms, and I think they serve pretty well as an introduction to the man's life and work and general approach to filmmaking. And Frank Borzaghi is a director that most modern audiences need to be introduced to. His films are remembered now, if at all, as sort of a historical footnote. Most, including this one, are only commercially available on a box set called Murnau and Borzaghi at Fox, implying that director Frank Borzaghi, who you see now in front of you in one of his acting roles as the lead in this short, implying that director Borzaghi was nothing more than the best of Murnau's imitators, and that, I think, is very untrue. First of all, Frank Borzaghi's work predates that of F.W. Murnau, who only began filmmaking in 1919, three years after this, which is not even close to Borzaghi's first film. Frank Borzaghi, he's, a, uh, he's an interesting character. He was one of the 12 directors who, in 1935, formed the Screen Directors Guild. Among that crew is also John Ford, who's a filmmaker who always seems to come up when I'm talking about movies, but a filmmaker who's of absolute primacy and importance in discussing the work of Frank Borzaghi, and in particular this film, which I think was a heavy inspiration on the westerns of Ford, in particular My Darling Clementine, which borrows whole sequences and the general sort of melancholy romantic tone of this film. Borzaghi was very popular, very famous in his day. An October 1915 issue of Motion Pictures magazine said that he has the reputation of having better control over facial expressions than any other screen artist before the public today. And I think that's fairly accurate. Even to this day, there's a, there's a sort of open-faced naturalism to these performances that you don't really see much, except possibly only otherwise in the works of Chaplin and the best moments of D.W. Griffith, whose Birth of a Nation only preceded this film by one year, but which seems juvenile in comparison to the maturity and complexity of this film, which is maybe a sixth the length of that one in comparison to this film's love story. Andrew Saris, in his book The American Cinema, put the work of Borzaghi about as well as anybody could. He said, Frank Borzaghi was that rarity of rarities, an uncompromising romanticist. Generally underrated on the assumption that the director's romanticism was a commercially motivated betrayal of realism. Yet the way of the romanticist is usually much harder than that of the realist. Audiences generally prefer realism, at least on the surface, and intimate love stories have always been box office poison. I think that's fairly accurate, and I think it's increasingly accurate. And a great bellwether of that is to compare the reputations of Howard Hawks' open-hearted, loving, the thing from another world, and John Carpenter's angry and cold, the thing, which has now surpassed the original in classic status. The last one of these I did was for Edgar Ulmer's film, The Amazing Transparent Man, which I think was rejected by audiences who didn't know what to do with a low-budget science fiction film with a core of anger behind it. And in this case, we have basically the exact situation, only amplified. Borzaghi's films are rejected now for his romanticism, but these early films in particular are rejected merely from the era they're a part of. Pre- sound films, silent films in general have an uphill battle. They're treated as some sort of half-achieved art form, when really what they are is an entirely separate art form, one which relies on communicating through gestures and through the human face, which at its best is a really beautiful thing. But even beyond that, pre-1920s silent films are, are particularly ignored. They're treated the way we treat sketches, really. They're not a, a true, legitimate, full use of an artist's creative talent. But I think that's wrong, and I think it's dangerous and reductive to treat 
15 or so era films that way because there's a lot of stuff that was going on that you don't quite see anymore because now we have codes and rules that aren't aren't to be broken as much but back then they kind of were still figuring out the the game and they were still figuring out what you could and couldn't do so you have some interesting structural choices like this film which is a western is unlike virtually any other western I'm aware of except of course My Darling Clementine which is sort of a singular film in its own right this film you spend the whole time waiting for a romance that never blossoms and a shootout that never comes it's sort of um there's that famous quote about how American lives have a first and a third act but no second act and this kind of works the same way we have this first act which for a 30 minute film is quite long we're now six minutes in and we haven't yet met the love interest or really in any substantive sense the villain or even really the conflict we just have this kind of slice of life look at a poor downtrodden cowboy and it's a first act that continues for a very long time and then an event happens there's a there's a bar fight and it's over in a second and it's never on screen and then we have a third act reconciliation so there's rising action and there's a denouement but there's no real traditional western climax to this film and i think that's really fascinating and makes this an experience you can't really find in many other films um it feels mature it's a film about consequences and it's a film about compromises and i keep coming back to my darling clementine which you'll see as this film ends my darling clementine borrowed the ending of this film almost shot for shot it's the same ending where the hero learns that he can't be with the woman and he shakes her hand instead of kissing her and rides off and there's a lovely moment in both films both films sort of walk this line between loneliness and quirkiness like this moment here coming up of Borzegi's character sleeping on top of his mule which first of all even his having a mule it's not played like Clint Eastwood having a mule where um, in Fistful of Dollars where it kind of belies the danger behind him in this case it's really an accurate representation of him his character is a mule he's a he's a nice stubborn workhorse who's not really impressing anybody but you know he's got character but it, 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 it speaks to the, the combination of loneliness and quirkiness at the film's core. And like John Ford's My Darling Clementine, this is a story about a man who exists between the middle of the East and the West. The East is represented by this woman who's coming, who's a well-educated, kind of naive, very sweet girl. And the West is represented by this man, Joe Mex, who's... Um, not super traditional bad guy he's he's more of um he's cursed by roughness more than more than anger but frank borzegi's character in this film like wyatt earp in my darling clementine exists in the middle see them he him putting the blanket under the mule's nose to protect it that's a that's one of those small intimate touches that you don't find in a lot of films even 20 or 30 years later than that that, that kind of instinct for pathos is something peculiar to Frank Borzegi. I don't think any filmmaker has ever mastered that on the level he has, with the possible exception of Chaplin. This guy here, Jack Richardson, playing Joe Mex, our villain, he worked with Frank Borzegi about a dozen times between 1913 and 1917. And then they parted ways. And then about 20 years later, in 1937, Frank Borzegi directed this film, History is Made at Night, which was one of his biggest successes. A film which had one sequence that seems like the visual blueprint for the of all the gin joints and all the towns and all the world scene in Casablanca. And in that film, History is Made at Night, Jack Richardson shows up for about a minute as a telegraph operator. And I've always wondered what that reunion was like after 20 years.
They lost contact, I'm pretty sure, because the Borzegi company, as well as seven other companies, all shut their doors within one week in 1917 because of the war. This information comes from the cinematographer L. Guy Wiley, who survived into the 1970s, is sort of an interesting parallel to Borzegi because just as Borzegi formed the Screen Directors Guild, L. Guy Wiley helped create the International Photographers Union, and for that, he was blacklisted. And he was thrown out of ASC, the American Society of Cinematographers, because he couldn't afford the dues. So he ended up a second unit cameraman on films like F.W. Murnau's Taboo. And um, he apparently finished his career in in Colombia just as a um, second unit cameraman and a camera assistant. And it's a shame because his camera work here is really exceptional. There's, um, there's a richness to the look of these exteriors that's kind of typical of the westerns of the 19-teens. The westerns of the 19-teens I love because you have films like this with their mature, loving heart, and then you have films like those of William S. Hart, who was the biggest star of the time until Tom Mix came along. And William S. Hart was a cattleman, and he was what we would now call a cowboy, and he brought this meticulous authenticity to his films. And his films, when you watch them, there's a harshness to them, and, a, and a, the dirt is palpable in every frame, and the faces are these long, lean faces that feel fairly honest. Um, in 1916, Buffalo Bill Cody who did as much as anybody to create the myth of the West, was still alive. He died the year later. His life story, his autobiography, hit print in Hearst International Magazine the month after this film. So it was kind of a vital and living time for the West. This was still living memory. So it's interesting then to look at this woman, Nita Dudley, played by Anna Little, who is essentially a thrill-seeking tourist, and she comes to the West seeking a Western adventure, which feels sort of meta and sort of fourth wall breaking, but was actually a, a pretty common thing. There was one town in Arizona in, I think, the 1880s that used to put on staged robberies as the train went by just to give the tourists a thrill. A lot of tourist money in the West came from people like this woman who fought, who came there to see bar fights and shootouts. And they're exactly what this film doesn't present to us. There's one bar fight in this film, and it's far from kind of the knockout brawl of something like John Ford's Straight Shooting, which came out the year later. It's the composition is brilliant. It's all. You miss the entire thing. A crowd forms and they dissipate and you see that someone was stabbed and that's as close as you get. And of course a gunfight never comes. What happens is our hero, Frank Borzaghi, takes the man he stabbed and puts him in his bed and nurses him. And the climax of the film and the real meat of the film is not a shootout. It's not a fight. It's a man nursing to health the man he stabbed. And that's what I mean when I say this film is about consequences, and that's what I mean when I say that this film was unusually mature for its era. If you look at Birth of a Nation, which again was the year before, it's a magnificently made film, and it's a large film, and there are moments of intimacy in it, but there's nothing quite like the sense of death that there is in this. This film is a film that, like the films of... Masaki Kobayashi in the 60s, this is a film that just hates death. Death is not an amusement here. And it's a film that loves life. And those are rare, and I think they should be cherished. Other sort of Western adventures of this era include Drummer of the Ninth, which was not directed by Frank Borzegi. I think it was uh, Thomas Ng, but it, it starred him. And that's another interesting film in the context of John Ford, because there's a sequence in that that the horse soldiers copies shot for shot, where a child climbs out of his window to join 
a marching regiment. Ford was very much inspired by the films of this era. This era was the, the era that he loved. So here we have, um, here we spend a little moment and it's our first real glimpse of the heroine. And we see her trying out being Western hero. Meanwhile, our Western hero is uninterested in the life he's a part of and he's uninterested in the woman in front of him who is sort of the predecessor to Chihuahua in John Ford's My Darling Clementine. And now here we're coming to the fight at the center of the film. It's, it's one punch and a whole crowd crowd that's half appalled and if you notice in the back the people in the back aren't appalled they're amazed they're tourists and here we have you'll see what I mean he stands up with the knife and we're ready for a fight and they're pulled down and you miss it what a beautiful composition you pull out just in time to see the grief of his woman and the knife on the table. And just like Nita, and just like all those rubberneckers in the back, you really miss what happened. And he takes no pride in it. But here we don't follow him. We cut back to the injured man, which is an amazing touch. See, I have to be careful here because I'm slowing down because I'm caught up in it. And each time I watch this film, when I start it, I think it's not as good as I remember it being. And each time around this moment, it becomes better than I remember it. It becomes the singular, one-of-a-kind film that nothing quite came close to until 1946 with My Darling Clementine, which is as much of a remake as that film is of Frontier Marshall and of the true life of Wyatt Earp, it's a structural and philosophical remake of this. Frank Borzaghi's younger brother, Danny Borzaghi, um, was a member of the John Ford Stock Company. He's, uh, he turns up in the background of a lot of his movies. He's playing the accordion in The Searchers at that funeral. His real function in those films was as the musical supervisor. And he, he, according to all reports, was always on set playing his accordion because it was, it was an essential part of the mood that Ford was trying to make. So there's this kind of kinship between the Borzaghi family and, and the work of Ford, who at this time was an actor under his brother, director Francis Ford. See, here we go, Nita realizing a Western drama is being enacted. That's what I mean about this surprisingly historically accurate sense of a woman who comes to the West looking to be part of a Western. But see, this is... We're now three or four minutes after he's shot and we're still really only focused stabbed, I mean, we're still really only focusing on the man who got stabbed. This woman here playing Nita and Little is an interesting figure. It's funny that she's got this part. She was the only real westerner, rough and tumble westerner on the set. Uh, she grew up in a ranch in California. And then she had a very good career. She, um... She played in a lot of westerns, and she was always either this kind of figure, this sort of naive eastern girl, or a Native American woman. And she did very well for herself, and then in 1925, she quit, and nobody knows why. At the top of her career, she left, and nobody... She would never talk about Hollywood. She'd never talk about why she left. It's kind of a big mystery. I don't know if you noticed, a few seconds ago, he tripped as he was walking up to her horse to speak to her, and that's one of those small idiosyncratic human moments that Borzaghi kind of lived for. Those moments of non-verbal, 
almost subliminal indications of a character's mental state. In this case, his sort of awkwardness around this woman who's clearly his superior. She, he won't take the seat on the back of her horse. He won't let her be in charge, but he, he carries he carries her like a servant. He brings her horse along. And this, this reminds me a lot of the meeting, the first meeting between Clementine and Wyatt Earp and my darling Clementine when he climbs up and he takes the bags off of the stagecoach for her. And it's another sort of action where the Western man is deferring to the gentility of a woman. And it's clearly a little outside of his range of expertise, but it's a sweet gesture. And her and her humanity is what brings Orzegi's character here back to the consequences of his action to the man he just killed. Or, well, didn't kill the man he he stabbed. And typically, Berzegi, it's played first in the interaction between him and a woman. And he's a little crushed. And this is what I like about films from this era. These long, still shots where you hold on an action like a man getting a chair for a woman and... If you're not interested, it's nothing, but if you're invested in the story, I mean, that little gesture, the, the length of time, I think is very affecting. You feel the indecision in his face. And we have this beautiful composition here. As all of a sudden, we realize it's morning and he spent the night. And she spent the night and her adventure, of course, isn't what she thought it was. It's she's matured as well. And here's another incredible moment where their expectations of one another are sort of confounded. And there's this that look that passed between them, that look of fascination but not complete understanding, and yet we're let in as an audience on both of them so well that we understand each motive and we understand what each isn't understanding. We understand what she expects of him from her expectations of being in the West, and we understand what he expects of her as a genteel Eastern woman. And Borzegi loves his love story, but he's smart enough to sort of put it in the background at the end of the scene and remind us of the meat of the scene. Frank Borzegi was one of those old Hollywood working directors who never seemed to be able to slow down. He directed at least 107 films. His first in 1913 and his last in 1961, which he didn't complete. It was Journey Beneath the Desert which actually was finished after he had to leave for health reasons by Edgar Ulmer. So there's kind of a nice little connection there that's of no interest to anybody but me. Of his 107 films, in his peak between 1913 and 1939, the only two years he directed less than one film were 1927 and 1928, when he made Seventh Heaven and Street Angel, which are often considered his two masterpieces. And they really are amazing films, they're just beautiful swooning kind of melodramas with a really dark heart. Later he found pretty big success with, among other films, his 1932 adaptation of A Farewell to Arms. Hemingway he hated the movie, and he hated the changes to it. But in truth, Borzegi's A Farewell to Arms is better than Hemingway's A Farewell to Arms, because whereas Hemingway has these moments of beauty, it's destroyed by his childish treatment of the leading lady, Catherine Barclay, who's sort of just a, a conduit for tempestuous male emotions of his lead. See, and this is what I'm talking about, about this weird structure of this film. We're now 24 minutes into a 30-minute short, and only now does the love story come up. It really is an example of Fitzgerald's saying about there being no second acts in American lives. And here, this scene, this is the climax of this story, of the two stories which are juggled in this film. Here is the scene where he finds out that this woman is engaged. 
and it's a life that even though he knew from the beginning he couldn't be a part of, it's a life that he now is reminded he can't be a part of. And this is the kind of thing I think you could only really get away with in films of no more than 30 minutes, this kind of relationship that's built on knowledge that you know from the beginning that it's not going to work, that's not confounded by the film's end, but reinforced. The drama of this film is, is, is unusual. It's, it's anti-drama. The fight was not the drama. The drama was the healing. And the drama here isn't love reaching across boundaries, but it's about accepting that love didn't reach across this boundary. It's something I'm glad isn't particularly common, because I think that would cheapen it. But I think in films like this, it's incredibly powerful. And it's made all the more powerful by the lack of dialogue. I think there's really not anything you could say here that would express the complicated emotions any more than their faces are doing. And each time I watch this, my eyes ping pong back and forth in this scene because they're both so expressive and they both you know so much about them without them saying anything, and that's a real strength of this genre. Part of the reason why I love westerns is how much information is delivered without being explicated. The chasteness of westerns is always kind of a weird thing, and when it works, it works beautifully, like in Shane or The Searchers or any, you know, there's that classic western ending where they, the romance never works. That's one of the defining features of the Western is that the romance never works. And it's something that predates this film, but I think there's very few films that do it as elegantly as this film because I think there are very few filmmakers with the instinct that Borzegi has. For example, here, this, this is shot for shot what My Darling Clementine would do with the handshake. And here, unlike in My Darling Clementine where the fence which represents civilization is behind her, because Clementine is protecting it. Here, it's directly between them. This fence is literally and figuratively a bridge that they can't cross. And it's, it's direct, but it's done with this kind of offhand grace. And then we pull, and we don't quite follow him yet, we focus on her. We iris out on her close-up because she's the one who learns the lessons. He who will see in a moment from a distance riding away is relatively unchanged. We, we leave her on that close-up and we leave him on this shot of him from a distance unchanged riding away and it's the ending of not only My Darling Clementine, it's the ending of Shane, it's the ending of The Fist of Dollars, it's the ending of The Searchers, it's the ending of all truly great westerns because it's kind of the defining image of the western. It's, it's a harshly anti-romantic genre and here, by being treated with such a richly romantic director, you want, you want the romance to work, and it doesn't, but you're okay, because they're kind of okay. And it takes a filmmaker of great skill to do that. Frank Borzaghi, I believe, was. And I think it's time he's reappreciated. And this film, I think it goes a long way to illustrating his philosophical and aesthetic approaches to filmmaking and why... He's such an important influence on so many great filmmakers, but also just such a compelling and unique filmmaker in his own right. So I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you very much for listening. Please visit shotcontext.blogspot.com for more of my film criticism. I'm John D'Amico. Thank you very much. 